Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to get back into some sports and some soccer because it's, or football, sorry. It's been a little while since I've done anything on this, so I'm uh, looking forward to it. Alright guys, so as always, I have my sidekick Roger here with me. He's ready to go. Miss Scarlet is outside because she has been a little rambunctious this morning. She's been trying to chase some squirrels. If you saw my previous video on the Great War, you saw all of that happening. So um, anyway, guys, uh, I have made a, an, ex an executive decision here. When it comes to sports stuff, um, I kind of dived into the, or dove into the deep end with a lot of these sports. And it's been nice, you know, like kind of getting an, intro, an, intro, an introduction. I cannot talk or read today uh, for some reason. Um, anyway, I have gotten a nice little introduction to some of the players and some of the rules and just kind of like a general look at the game. And that applies to rugby and cricket and football. And there's still some sports that I haven't gotten to yet, like uh, some of the like uh, race race car driving, and AFL, and even darts. I've had a couple of people ask me to take a look at darts, which I would have never thought about. Um, I think snooker was mentioned as well. So I do enjoy uh, sports myself. I grew up playing them. I enjoy watching them. and um, But I've always just kind of been privy to American sports, and not ha I really haven't like paid attention to sports outside of the United States. And since I am trying to learn more about the world, uh, I think sporting events are a huge part of the cultures of other countries. And so that is kind of one of the other reasons why I'm trying to kind of learn or wrap my head around some of this stuff. But, um, you know, my, my channel has always been kind of like focused on history primarily. And I think history is really important for giving you context for the present day. And especially if you're new to a sport like me, and you don't have the context of it like you would if you had grown up in that culture or in that country, watching a sport all your life, you know, I feel a little lost with a lot of stuff. So I've made a decision that I would like to uh, kind of go back and learn more about the history of these sports so that I can kind of learn where they came from, learn about the big names, learn about the teams, the big teams, and Kind of how it evolved over time and I think that that will help me a little bit with some of this context that I'm talking about. So I've been uh, looking up online like some history documentary type stuff about each of these sports and of course football I think being kind of like a bigger deal than cricket or rugby is going to have a little bit more out there on it but I found this like 13 episode documentary on the history of football, the beautiful game. And it goes all the way from the origins to kind of like the present day. And it talks about different topics within, you know, this universe of football, I guess I should say. So I've decided to um, watch this. And this is gonna be like a series that goes on on my channel. Um, so when it, regarding football. So I am uh, really looking forward to kind of learning about the history of football going, I think it looks like it's going to go way back to kind of like maybe prior to England. Um, and, you know, England is, I think, touted as the country that kind of invented football or whatever. But I'm kind of wondering, well, were there origins of football prior to that even that, that we don't know about? So um looks like that's what this particular episode is going to this particular video is going to tackle for us. Now it is long, it's about an hour long, so I'm going to be splitting these up into two parts just to make it a little bit more manageable of a watch for me and for you guys. So we'll uh, we'll cut it off about halfway through and then I'll do part two later on. Um, but yeah, we're going to go ahead and dive into this. I really don't know what to expect, but it does look like a really highly um, produced documentary. And it, I think, may have been the BBC that did it. So it might get blocked on YouTube. We're gonna, I'm gonna try uploading it anyway, and hopefully it'll be fine. If it's not, it'll go on my Patreon. But um, fingers crossed, fingers crossed that it does okay on YouTube. 
So anyway, here we go. Let's take a look at the history of football, the beautiful game and its origins. Pues yo creo que cada, cada uno tiene su filosofía y, y su manera de ver lo que es el fútbol, ¿no? Por ejemplo, el fútbol para mí es mi vida, porque el fútbol me ha dado todo. Y me encantaría que hubiese una investigación profunda de quién fue esa persona. Porque esa persona, no hay que hacer una estatua, no hay que hacer un monumento, sino debe de quedar ahí en la historia como uno de los grandes genios que ha habido en el mundo. Porque así, quien inventó la penicilina, quien inventó el teléfono, quien inventó la televisión, sí. eh, la gravedad, esos grandes genios de la humanidad, el que inventó el fútbol, hay que adorarle como si fuera un dios. <risa> so, who is that person that invented football? The origins of football is a history of signs and symbols, gods and games. Sports have long been the provenance of history's great civilizations, and it is through these that the game we know as football was conceived, shaped and refined. Three thousand four hundred years ago, in the country we now know as Mexico, Mesoamericans played the first team sport using a ball made of rubber. Hmm. It was a game the Mayans later adopted. For them, the ball symbolized the sun, its power, its fertility, and in an act that foreshadowed football's dark and violent history, the losing captain would be sacrificed to the gods. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, so would it be fair to say that Americans actually invented football? I don't. Know. I don't want to start arguments. No, I'm just. I'm just playing around, guys. Um, okay, that's really interesting. Also, rubber. I thought rubber was a modern, more of a modern invention because it's. What is rubber actually made out of? Actually, I thought it was like a synthetic material, but I'm sure there's some animal products <laughs> involved in rubber. How is it, what is it exactly made out of? Because I didn't realize that rubber would have gone back 3,400 years. That's, that's new information for me. Also, uh, you don't want to lose the freaking game with the Aztecs, oh my God. The Chinese proved more forgiving. Su Chu, a popular sport of the Han Dynasty, celebrated life, not death. Around 136 BC, Li Yu, a local poet, said of it, the ball is round, the playing field square, just like the sky and the earth. The ball flies over us like the sun, while the two teams face each other. The game spread to Japan and was renamed Kamari. So this would have been um, developed almost simultaneously. Obviously, I don't think you know there would have been any sort of communication between the Aztecs and these guys. Uh, I don't. I mean, I, I don't know what migration patterns were and stuff like that. But um, I guess it's reasonable to say that this game developed kind of simultaneously in two different cultures. Which is really interesting that uh, now I'm sure that maybe the Chinese and the Japanese had different, a different way of playing it or whatever. I'm hoping they'll show that right here. But it's fascinating how many different cultures can think up the same thing.
thing. I guess it's just part of being human. You know, we're all human at the end of the day. We all have brains. We all kind of maybe think along the same lines regarding certain things, uh, particularly like when it comes to inventing things and so forth, um, to a certain extent, I think. So it's just, it's just a really interesting concept to think about. <laughs> え、今から約 Highly ritualized Kamari was more ceremonial than the informal game that later developed. うん、決まりは、え、決まりのその晴れ会を。する前に必ずこの丸を神前に備えます。そして、ま、決まりを、あ、下げてきて、枝丸の木、時丸の木というものをいたしますが、その時には枝役がやはり国宝城世界平和とまあそういうことを記念してそれから丸を蹴りますオッケーワオ蹴丸はえ大体六名ないし八名で蹴りますそして蹴丸の最大の特徴は勝負がありません勝ち負けがありませんその八人が仲良く
Wait, the Greeks were maybe the first. <laughs> this is so. Uh, this is this is just really interesting. I had just you know based on everything I'd heard, you know, everybody was like, well, England invented it, and maybe that's more of um, England invented the current modern version of football that we have. So that might be fair to say. Um, but the, as far as like the origins of that, the actual game and where the English got some of their ideas from. You know, maybe it dates back further in history, like we're seeing here. I don't know. I, I'm assuming we're we're gonna like get up to present day, so we'll see how this evolves into what we have now. Um, but this is a really interesting. I. It's just crazy to think all of the stuff that that, you know, you just you just have a, this view of the world as. The modern world that you live in as being very novel and and you don't really realize just how far back so many things go throughout human history and that you know the way we do things the way we live now is really not that different than it was thousands of years ago it's just like little little tweaks have happened as technology has evolved or as society has evolved but the fundamentals are the same so this is why it's really important to learn history, guys. It's really, really important to learn history. And I think people overlook this aspect. A lot of people say it's important to learn history because you don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. That's true. I think it's even more important to learn history, though, so that you have context for the present. And so that you kind of broaden your horizons and you realize that um, humans are all connected, really throughout time with our with our traditions and our similarities um, between societies and cultures throughout histories. The more the more you learn, the crazier it is to think about. It's debatable whether they initiated or indeed influenced the games played on the island. But what is known is that a thousand years after the Romans left, the Britons were playing a variety of ball sports, foremost of which were the games of folk football. Usually played on the Shrovetide holiday or at Christmas and New Year, such games were steeped in pagan ritual. Their true origins veiled by one of the oldest, grisliest, yet best known football myths that the first balls were human heads. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. No, God, please don't show graphic stuff right now. Sometimes an old custom has its origin in a source we cannot define or know and can be looked on almost as a, a secretion of history. There's this old story um, about Tusker, a petty tyrant who oppressed the people who bullied them and eventually the ro people rose up in revolt against him. Um, he realized that time, the game was up, it was time to go, so he fled to the mainland of Scotland. However, the, a local champion decided that the thing to do was to put an end to this forever. Eventually he caught up with Tusker at the old city of Perth. He slew him in single combat and cut his head off. And uh, the local champion tied Tusker's head to the pommel of his saddle and rode north to Orkney. And as he did, these teeth cut into his leg and eventually infected it and he got ill and more ill and eventually went septic. However, with his dying strength, he managed to get back to Kirkwell and he climbed up the, the Merkel Cross in front of the cathedral and there he threw the grisly head to the waiting people ah. below to show them that their oppressor was indeed dead. He then died. And so infuriated were the people at this, the champion's death, that they kicked around the head of Tusker in their anger and grief. Was this on Horrible Histories? I am watching Horrible Histories over on Patreon, guys, and I feel like one of the recent episodes I watched had a story, because they do a, a sketch called Stupid Deaths in that, and I feel like this was 
one of those sketches or it was a similar story where like the, a beheaded head like cut hit the teeth cut into the leg and the guy died of, of uh, infection or something I swear that I heard that on Horrible Histories I don't know if it's the same story though or if it was a different one but oh gosh it's so good and I, I actually I, I mean what do you guys think did this really happen or is this just like one of those folklore myths <laughs> The legend, whether true or not, is still enacted year in, year out by the people of Kirkwall, Scotland. No way! Making it one of the last strongholds of a game which for hundreds of years dominated Britain. <laughs> the game itself is remarkably is similar to on? other long abandoned folk matches played on the island. The pitch is the entire town. The players number in their hundreds. The goals are local landmarks a mile apart. What One is goal going was on? Generally, all it took to win the game, although that could take a whole day. In Kirkwall, two sides compete: the up the gates and the down the gates. Their struggle for the ball or bar is deeply symbolic. The tradition was for a long time that if the down the gates managed to get the bar, which was the fertilizing influence of the sun, um, it was the sun and its fertilizing influence, and they threw it into the waters of the harbor, then that would bring good fishing. And if the up the gates got the bar to their goal, and they were mostly farmers, that would bring good crops, particularly good potatoes. And there was a small town in Norway that until recently phoned every New Year's Day to see which way the bar had gone so they could ass assess whether or not there was going to be good fishing in the months ahead. So it's like Groundhog Day here. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Okay. This is kind of leaving me speechless seeing this right here. I'm seeing, okay, I'm starting to kind of like see the origins of like this warfare mentality towards football that you guys have been telling me about in, in Europe. Kind of like, because if, if this is kind of like how it got started, then I can understand like ultras and kind of where all of that germinated from maybe. Yeah, this is definitely a sports mentality that we do not have over here in the United States. We don't do this stuff right here. It's not that serious <laughs> for us. For us, it really is just a game. Now, I mean, we do we do get behind our teams, particularly when it comes to like college teams, where you have a loyalty to the school that you went to. Um, that's about as close as we get to like club, you know, football teams over here. There is a huge loyalty to your your college or your university, and there's rivalries and. You know, schools will play, you know, um, say practical, they're not really practical jokes. Like, they will try to, like, do these, like, you know, like steal the mascot of the other school or poison a, a tree that is, like, symbolic for the university. Stuff like that happens sometimes. But you're not going to see us getting fights over, generally. Like, once in a blue moon, it might happen, you know fans in the stands get overheated about something, but it's extremely rare and we don't, like, it's, it's not like this for us. So uh, this is really interesting to see kind of like maybe where the mentality that Europeans have towards football comes from. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a very different cultural thing to what we have over here. <laughs> Oh my gosh! In terms of roughness, there are no rules. It's hard, it's a hard physical contest. Perhaps sometimes old scores are settled, but uh, generally speaking, there is little gratuitous violence. For all its rough and tumble, folk football was more often than not folklore. Not so for the Calcio Historica played in Florence, Italy. Here was a game 
which directly acknowledged its debt to the ancient Roman game of Harpastum. Questo gioco, tanto in uso fra i legionari romani, fu introdotto anche nella colonia Florentia. Con l'andar del tempo i fiorentini se ne appropriarono. Calcio's history is as rich in antiquity as any of the English folk games. Florentines proudly recall the legend of the Sedio, an infamous match played in defiance of its enemies. Candy cane drummers. <laughs> Nel 1530 i fiorentini erano assediati dalle, dalle truppe imperiali di Carlo V e per non interrompere l'usanza di carnevale, di giocare per carnevale, il 17 febbraio giocarono una partita a scherno degli assedianti che ormai credevano Firenze soccombente. Such bravado typifies a game infused with violence. A game where men test themselves and master both their fear and their opponent. In the Sedio of 1530, one player became the embodiment of these virtues, Dante da Castiglione. Una regola fondamentale era quella che la palla doveva essere sempre in movimento. Il morticino degli antinori non mollava il pallone, lo teneva con sé. E per il, il forte Dante da Castiglione prese calciante e pallone che non era fermo perché era in movimento in quanto lo teneva in braccio e portò fino alla rete avversaria e scagliò dentro calciante e pallone marcando la caccia. Calcio è un gioco adorato da tutti i florentini, ma è anche riven con distinzioni di classe e social standing. Questo è come il rugby o l'America Mentre i nobili lo giocavano nelle maggiori piazze con eh, intensa partecipazione di pubblico. Il viceversa, il popolo si intratteneva a questo ludo proprio in considerazione che era il loro gioco e veniva praticato da tutte le parti, tant'è che girando per le strade di Firenze si può ancora vedere su palazzi o vicino alle chiese delle targhe di marmo o di pietra dove i signori otto di guardia e balia e proibivano di giocare appunto vicino alle chiese oppure per le strade a questo gioco spontaneo che tutti i fiorentini giocavano. Restrictions such as these were commonplace in Britain. Shops and homes were regularly damaged as the players rampaged through towns. Many died from their wounds. You can almost write the history of the game, folk game of football, in terms of people trying to stop it, of local authority issuing edicts, royals issuing proclamations against it, colleges trying to stop their members playing it, because it's turbulent, because it's violent, because um, it poses a threat to law and order on that particular day when the games take place. Hmm. As early as 1314, King Edward II banned football in London, proclaiming for as much as there is a great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils might arise, which, God forbid, we commend and forbid such a game to be used in the city in future. Edward's descendants were equally dismissive. Henry V waged war against it, as did Henry VIII, who believed it was distracting young men from their archery. Yet okay. neither could stop football being played. And when, in the 19th century, football finally received a fatal blow, it was not an act of man, but of machinery. So I guess as it 
Is it fair to say also that football, at least in Britain, it sounds like in Italy too, um, was kind of a way for the more common folks to um, rebel against the uh, royalty, I guess, uh, the king, the crown, or whatever. And so that kind of had a like a, a commonality uh, of the people and gave them something to kind of unite behind as well. And so it was almost like a, a political statement in, in a way social political statement uh if that's if that's the case uh that's that's the vibe i'm getting here and i hope i have that right if i don't let me know in the comments but if that's the case um i i, I feel like a lot of you guys have commented on my previous football videos that 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 is like kind of how you guys feel about it is that it was um a way to kind of like stick your finger in the eye of, of the crown or whatever um, and any sort of like oppression that they had against against the people of Britain. So again, like a different, you have like origins of warfare and then origins of like a rebellion against your government, your your king. Um, it looks like as well. So that shows just like how deeply ingrained this is in in Europe because it has those extra layers of meaning uh, behind it that American sports do not have. Like, I think all sports in a sense are kind of like a modern day warfare in a sense, you know, um, and, it, and it allows you to kind of, you know, compete without that violence, you know, that may have existed back in the day, like the Romans and the Colosseum or whatever, or the Aztecs, <laughs> as we learned. Um, but yeah, America, but that's where American sports starts and ends. Like we, we don't, we've never really gone beyond that. I, that, that, that I know of, um, it's always just been a game over here. Uh, so I'm, I'm starting to see how, like how just deeply rooted this sport is in European society and why you guys take it so seriously. <laughs> The threat that um, folk football posed to the rise of an urban society in the early 19th century uh, was, was serious in a way. You can't have the old games that have been played in a kind of pre-industrial environment played in the great expanding urban industrial centres. Hmm, that's interesting. Local towns and cities pass acts and pieces of legislation to curb the old traditional games from being played in their own towns and on their streets. This is a world where football has to find a new location to be played. The old folk game is dead. The game was rescued from oblivion by the public schools of England, who were in turn endeavouring to save themselves. In the 1850s, most were struggling with falling admissions and violent pupils. Students oh, okay. rioted, burnt down classrooms, and attacked locals. The what? teachers, many of them vicars, were horrified. Given the mentalities of the pupils at the time, and given their lack of personal self-control, that frame of mind had to be changed. And so emerged as a form of social control, the process of turning hooligans into heroes. And the essence of reform was the playing field. And the rationale behind this was very simple. If you beat hell out of each other on the games field, you weren't quite so predisposed to beating hell out of the villagers or the local right. inhabitants. Right. Religion That's... became the backbone of wow. this sporting revolution. Muscular Christianity, the belief that sports were a useful aspect of religious training, taught boys that a fit body bred a fit mind, that fair play and teamwork on the playing field promoted moral fortitude. Well, isn't that like also an ancient philosophy? I feel like Plato, was it Plato that said stuff like that? I think he has, has a famous quote of a uh, strong body, strong mind or something along those lines. Don't quote me exactly, but 
so that that must be uh, one of the like Western philosophy traditions that made its way into the church at some point as well. I'm assuming. Each school evolved its own version of football. Some, like Harrow, favoured a kicking game, while others, such as rugby school, were allowed to handle, run and hack down opponents. This rich diversity was to become the starting point for the modern game. I think the public school teams firstly kept the games going and then the, pr probably the real significance is at the moments at which public school boys went to university together uh, or when they left school, left university and needed, wanted to carry on playing the games and therefore needed, needed an agreed form of the games to play and that's what leads us into the, the codification uh, of football. On oh, the interesting. Of okay. That's, that's so the clubs and stuff came out of that. Okay, that's that. See, the way your sports um, progress over in in Britain is very different to the United States, where our football started in the universities. That's where our first football teams were were in the universities, and that's why college football is such a big deal. Is because that's where it started over here in the U.S., and it has a much longer tradition than it, than the uh, NFL does, and that's why it's such a big thing over here. Um, so it started in the universities and then there needed to be, I guess, a, a place for uh, guys to still play these sports when they left university. And so that's where the professional sports came in eventually. Um, they didn't come in until decades after the university started playing. So it took some time, I guess, for that. But for you guys, it was starting in the public schools and then... You guys don't really do uh, much sporting in the in university, not on the level that the U.S. does, uh, I don't think. So uh, for you, it's it's the professional leagues is where you guys transition to, I guess, out of public school. So, or did anyway. Uh, so is, is it really interesting to see uh, how sports uh, diverge and how the different, uh, different cultures kind of develop them differently? Of course, I'm just talking about the U.S. versus Britain. I'm sure in there, there's all kinds of other countries to consider, too. Australia, Italy, all of the different countries that play sports, which is probably most of them on, on Earth, um, have different ways of developed or different ways that they developed in those countries. Of October 1863, 11 London clubs met at the Freemasons Tavern to discuss a universal set of rules. So the clubs already Having existed agreed in 1863. to call themselves the Football Association, an impasse was reached. The supporters of the rugby code opposed any law which might prevent handling or hacking, a bone of contention for those who wanted to see a kicking game. The deadlock was broken on the 8th of December, when hacking and handling were banned. It was a decision mean? which left football with two codes, association football and rugby. Hmm. Yet even after the football association was formed, the rules of the game were flexible. Many people misunderstand the development of the game. They think that in 1863, the football association was founded, a set of rules was created, and that was it. That wasn't it. If you asked a player in the 1860s or 1870s, uh, are you a football or a rugby player, they probably would have said, I'm sorry, I don't understand, what are you talking about? Because it was quite common for teams to play association in the first half of the game, to play rugby in the second half of the game. What? You agreed really? the rules on a match-by-match -match basis. You could have 10, 11, 12, 14, 16, 20, as many players as the other team agreed. Oh my gosh. Such confusion was never more pronounced than when teams from England met teams from Scotland. Oh gosh. Queen's Park, the Scots' greatest side, had pioneered a game which involved passing the ball between players, a style the English chose to dismiss. 
the English tended to, uh, it was more, you could see more vestigial traces of rugby, I think, in the way that English players played. Um, the English players, when they played Queen's Park, were very keen that hacking should be kept. Uh, deliberate kicking of the shins. Uh, there is a letter oh. from Lord Kinnaird. Uh, to Queen's Park, arranging a friendly and saying, let's have hacking, it's such fun. Oh Which depended gosh. on what end of the hack you were at, I think. Yeah. That would hurt. For the public school boys, football was a pastime, not a sport. As a consequence, the game lacked continuity, passion, drama. Football needed a visionary, someone who could take its essence and mould it into something irresistible. Charles Alcock is one of the most influential. That's interesting to me that public, so it was a big, in, big thing in schools. Um, see, the U.S. took that and had the schools compete against each other. And that's where the passion came from, was the competition between schools and rivalries that developed. Um, so it was interesting to see that that didn't happen in, in Britain, that you guys did not use the schools in that way regarding sports that is more of just like he said like a pastime activity that you do in schools rather than a way for schools to compete and for people to get behind teams in in the school setting um so that's a that's a weird concept for americans because schools are such an integral part or sports are such an integral part of our education in schools uh high schools even have huge football followings, you know, you'll get thousands of people going to a high school football game in certain areas of the country. Uh, so for us, it's really weird to hear this, that it's not like a thing in schools over there. You know, you, it's like you didn't even think about it or something. Um, instead, you guys develop the clubs, I guess. So I think Scarlett is wanting in. Hang on a sec. Okay, guys, Scarlett's back. <laughs> Hopefully she'll settle down here. All right, so yeah, anyway, uh, I just wanted to, to mention that. Actual men in the start of football was a boy at Harrow. Indeed, he was a boy at Drury's house, one of the houses playing here today. And when he left Harrow, he was instrumental in organizing the Football Association. And he actually invented and started the FA Cup, which is based on the inter-house Harrow football. I want, to, I want to say right here, I have seen, there's a, there was a documentary released in 2013 of Harrow, a very British school, and I really enjoy it. I, I watched that. I just found it on YouTube randomly one day, and uh, I like, like, education documentaries, and so I decided to watch that and learned all about Harrow and the traditions that they have, and I learned that they have, like, their own, like, version of rugby that they play just there, and they have, like, weird rules that you have to learn when you, like, when you're a... Uh, Oh gosh, what was the term that they used for the first year pupils? Oh, I forgot. It's been a while since I've I watched it. There's like a special uh, term that they have for the first year students there. Uh, and it was it was like a point in the documentary that they had to like learn th these bizarre new rules of Harrow rugby or whatever. First played in 1871, the FA Cup is the world's oldest football tournament. Oh, wow. The importance of the FA Cup is, is pretty clear. What it does is establish the really key element of competition and knock out nature of that competition as a way forward for football. And indeed, what, what happens in the World Cup now, what happens in the, the European League now, what happens in any number of worldwide and regional competitions, it's the knockout competitions that r really catch the eye and draw the crowds. The success of the FA Cup persuaded Charles Orcock to arrange the first ever international match. On St Andrew's Day, 1872, 4,000 people gathered to watch the home side, Scotland, take on England. With no previous example to draw on, the match proved somewhat makeshift. How did you know how to dress up for a game? It was the first international game. So the English players, they had white shirts with the three rampant lions on, but hmm. that was it. They played in the colours of the schools that they had played for. So oh. we have knowledge that some players were old Etonians, some players were old Herovians, and they were playing in red 
or red and white because of course in those days it hadn't occurred to people that if you all wore the same strip it made <laughs> identification on the field easier although I will say that even at that game the English wore caps the Scots wore cowls the sort of hood you would get on an anorak because it hadn't occurred to either team that heading the ball was a useful thing to do in football. It's so weird just how like basic parts of the game that we take for granted today, like obviously it would be easier to play on a team if everybody wore the same thing, right? Uh, that they hadn't thought about that back then. It's so weird to think about. England began the match with eight attackers and dribbled with the ball. Scotland fielded six forwards and passed the ball between themselves a revolutionary tactic which would have a profound impact on world football. It's not important because it was the first game, because that's a statistical freak. It's important because you had two cultures clashing in the one game and the dominant culture, the successful culture, the Scottish passing and running culture, being taken back through those English players and that is why that game is the most important game ever played in the history of world football. Wow. Almost all of that. the first international players were public schoolboys, a reflection of the total dominance wielded by the upper classes over football. For soccer to emerge as the world game, it would first have to become the people's game. Apostles mm. were needed energetic men who could spread the game to the working classes. The church was important in sending out its young missionaries, its curates, its vicars, its Sunday school teachers, to persuade large numbers of working people to follow the working men, to follow the game which they themselves enjoyed. Uh, that cult of muscular Christians, of young men who were steeped in Christian faith but believed that physical activity, best expressed through team sports, was the way young men ought to play and express themselves. And what better, what cheaper, what easier way of uh, developing a sport than football? The easiest game in the world to play. Hmm. Football spread throughout the country. Although it was in the industrial north, a working class stronghold, that the game really took off. I think industrialisation is absolutely vital. It's, it's very hard to imagine a mass sporting culture developing in a non-industrial non culture at, at that time. Uh, it, above all, it's an industrial culture which provides the regularity of wages uh, and the, the structure of the week, the working week, with clear breaks for leisure time, which, re which allows the game to emerge. There's no coincidence that in counties like Lancashire that you can begin to see the working class popular teams emerge almost at the moment at which the, the Saturday half holiday is granted. The half day Saturday liberated thousands of men from the drudgery of work and created an environment in which football could rapidly expand. As a byproduct of the Industrial Revolution, its significance to football was only marginally more important than the coming of the railways. The railways are hugely important. You, you could not have national league structures without railways. The notion of football teams travelling the length and breadth of the country, to a lesser extent uh, supporters travelling the length and, length and breadth of the country, is just impossible without the railways. Throughout the latter half of the 19th century, football was parasitic feeding off the growth in industry and technology. As a result, new clubs sprang up throughout England, absorbing players and administrators. The teams that emerge in the uh, 1880s and 1890s, that, and many of them household names today, emerge from a number of institutions that already exist. It's men meeting in a pub and deciding they'd like to form a football club, football team. It's men in the place of work, Arsenal, the Woolwich Arsenal, deciding that they'd like to play. It's men in, let's say, a railway company at Manchester United, North Manchester Railway. Um, wow. It's groups of working men in the institutions they belong to, the church, the Sunday school, the trade union, the place of work, the pub, 
all the institutions that are basic to working class life, spawn the new football clubs. That's how the clubs, so many of which we know today, in professional form, that's where they emerge from. Wow. All right, guys, uh, I think we're going to leave it there. We're about halfway through this at this point, and we'll uh, pick it up here in part two, okay? Um, my goodness, I am so glad I decided to do this, guys. Um, this is, I think, going to give me a completely different appreciation for the game of football. It's going to help me understand, like I said, give me context for a lot of these teams and, you know, the history of it. And it's fascinating just seeing how differently sports developed over in Britain compared to what I know over here in the U.S. And, and seeing, you know, you guys just leave so many uh, comments on my videos about like how integral it is to your society. And um, it's, a, it's a working man's game. It developed out of the, the working classes. And I've seen references to, to it being a public school thing, association football being, um, you know, a, a posh sport. And that's where the term soccer came from, was, was from them basically calling it soccer as an abbreviation of, um, of uh, association football, basically. Um, so it, it is very, very cool to kind of see how the church even helped facilitate uh, these these club teams with that mentality of um, trying to kind of rein in the hooligans and uh, giving them an activity to do to kind of like take out their their aggressions and that desire for competition and and stuff you you take it out on the field um, in more of a friendly competition I say friendly because I know that there there's like the ultra culture and stuff and there is that aspect of it being like coming out of warfare and so it's just it's just fascinating to see the difference over in Britain and how you guys approach uh, sports and approach you know your biggest game football uh, our biggest game over here is also football just a different version of it um, so I'm really uh, I, I really can't wait to, to watch part two here and um, kind of see, I guess it's going to go up to the present day. And it's cool also to see where some of the teams came from, like Arsenal, he's talking about um, coming from just like a workplace, basically, and also Manchester United coming out of like a real railway company. Um, it's just like, I don't, I actually don't even know like where our professional sports came from and how that evolved. Um, so, you know, I'm probably going to have to do some documentaries on American sports as well. So I'm sure some of you guys would be interested in learning how, like, our sports evolved over here. Uh, I'm interested now also, uh, after watching this, I'm kind of, like, asking questions about, like, well, where, how did exactly did the NFL get started, you know? Um, and how did we take uh, these, these sports, rugby and football, uh, over in Europe and develop our own version of football over here. So those are questions that I'd like to answer for myself anyway. Um, and might try to put some of that stuff up on my channel also. So very, very interesting documentary um, for sure. I hope you guys have enjoyed this today. Hopefully I'm praying, praying that YouTube will let me upload this because uh, I really, really want this to go up on my channel instead of uh, on uh, Patreon. But if you guys had enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. I would certainly appreciate that. And also, if you're interested in any of my social media, you can check that stuff out in the description and pin comment of this video. And yeah, as always, uh, Roger and I thank you guys for watching. Stay tuned for part two. Scarlet's under the desk, so I can't show you her. her Scarlet came was pointed that direction, but. Yeah, anyway, I can't wait for part two, and hope you guys will be back for that, so stay tuned for that, and we'll see you next time.